Hey everyone, Lucas B here for another episode of Screenflow Live on another beautiful Wednesday afternoon at 2.30 our time. Uh, today we're talking about audio, different ways to bring audio in, what to do once you get your audio in, and then we'll probably look at a little bit of exporting stuff on audio. And then of course I'm here to answer as many audio questions as I can. Just a disclaimer, I am not an audiophile. Audio is not my number one thing. I do know a lot about it, but it's not, uh, I wouldn't consider myself even the expert here at Telestream, let alone in the whole world. So uh, just keep that in mind as we get into the show today, but uh, here's just a quick message from our sponsors, which is ourselves. back and just like always before we get started i want to just tell you about a couple things uh first of all if you want to follow us on social media we are on social media we are on facebook facebook.com slash screenflow we are on twitter at screenflow and then we're on youtube and you can find all of these videos rehosted on youtube again just type screenflow tube and you will find us there you can also sign up for email notifications for the show when we go live. Um, should be right down here at the bottom. Telestream.net slash ScreenFlow Live. That'll just give you a little heads up about what we're talking about today and when we are going live. Also, one last thing, which I think we forgot to talk about before we started the show today, but we have a webinar coming up. It's going to be a ScreenFlow advanced webinar. We're going to be going over top five tips that I have right now for creating and doing things in an advanced manner in ScreenFlow. And it's not going to be like a ScreenFlow live show here. It's going to be um, just full webinar where we have people come into the webinar platform. You can ask questions and it's about an hour long instead of about 25 minutes like we usually do here. So uh, that is coming up. Ooh, I almost remember the date for that. The 16th? 26th, 26th of April coming up. Uh, that should be next week, I believe. Yeah, a week from tomorrow. So um, be sure to look out for your email or you can ask us, uh, send us a message. We'll give you the link to that. Um, the video stops. Ooh, having some issues there. You said, Myra, it looks like you're having some issues watching the video on, on Facebook. I would just restart Chrome or whatever browser you're using, open it back up and see if it's helping. Um, but with that, let's get into a little bit of screen flow action. Uh, I've got right here, if we switch to my desktop, I've got my screen flow uh, new recording window up. And this is really where audio starts. By the way, if you have any questions, just ask ahead in, go ahead and ask in that Facebook area. Um, I'm happy to answer as many questions as I can. Um, but this is where you start with audio. For those of you who have never used ScreenFlow before, which I'm not sure we get a lot of brand new people, but this is where you can choose your audio. And if I zoom in here a little bit, you can see that we've got record your desktop, record your iOS device, record your video, and then record your computer audio or record audio from a specific source. And if I turn that off, recording computer audio, that's the most basic. If you have anything that would originally play out through your speakers and you want to record that when recording with ScreenFlow, go ahead and do that right here. Record computer audio, all your YouTube videos, the music that's playing in the background. Anything that you're doing that is playing through the computer will be recorded if you enable this checkbox. Now, more importantly, I would say, is the record audio from. ScreenFlow can record internal computer, the computer audio, but it can also record from one external source as well. And right now, as you can see, I have my AT2020 USB Plus. That's this handy dandy dude right here. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Excuse me, my internal microphone, which uh, you can see is just maxed out. That's just the microphone that's built into my Mac laptop that I'm doing this presentation off of. 
um, we have a C Media USB audio device. That's actually something that's plugged into my computer right now. That's routing audio from my computer back into the Wirecast system, so you guys can hear it, and so I can hear it. So in this case, I actually wouldn't want to record from that. And then data source item zero, which I think has to do with uh, Wirecast, as a matter of fact. But if you have different audio sources plugged in, you can come into this dropdown and choose the one that you want. And you can tell the moment I click it, other th different audio sources they have different audio levels in just the way that they're built the way that they're connected to your computer when i'm on this super sweet microphone as i get closer you can see those lines go way high and when i get further away they drop down because it's already reading the audio signal it's coming in when i choose my internal microphone you can see it just like maxes out really easily it's probably because it's really sensitive and very uh ready for uh listening to audio so i'm going to go back to this condenser microphone and before we do any audio recording, I'm going to open up this box. And this is configure how the ATT, configure how this audio source will be mixed by default for new documents. You can pull in different audio channels. To tell you the truth, unless you really know what you want to do here, I wouldn't even touch it. I never touch this because I like my audio to be uniform and it's going to be uniform. I'm not generally doing tricky things with audio. You can do tricky things with audio, but if you're going to do them, you probably want to have something like this. I'm going to hold that up to the, the camera a little bit. I think you guys can kind of see it's a little blurry. This is made by a company called Tascam and they call it an audio interface for public or for professional broadcasting. It's, uh, it's just a lightweight little thing. It doesn't even have a power cord, cord. It just pulls power out of your computer. And it can deal with different types of microphone inputs. And you can do a little bit of mixing before you even bring it into ScreenFlow. And if I had this plugged into my computer, you'd be able to see it as an audio source just like this microphone. Now, one of the reasons why you'd want to use this is because not all microphones are created equal. And they all have different input or uh, uh, con connection how do I want to say that? Uh, they have different inputs. So, for example, this microphone, this AT and T, this AT twenty twenty USB. This is made by Audio Technica. I think it's about one hundred and thirty bucks. This is a USB condenser microphone. So, what is a condenser? A condenser is the type of microphone that it is. There's a a piece of mechanical hardware in there that captures the sound, and you're going to get really good quality. This is for these kind of environments, a uh, closed room with not a lot of external noise. I can go sit in a sound studio, use a condenser microphone. If you go to like a live concert and people are using those sure, like classic uh, rock and roll mics, those are not condenser microphones. Those are better for loud environments like that. But if you're going to be recording audio for use in ScreenFlow and you're looking to buy a mic, I would definitely recommend a, a condenser USB microphone in the 100 to $200 range. If you do a little bit of research with those parameters, you're bound to get a good one. Uh, another one that we like to use here is the Yeti, the Blue Yeti um, studio mic. That's also a USB condenser mic, and they're really awesome. One of the reasons why I like them so much is because you just plug USB into your computer and it gets read immediately. You don't have to download drivers, nothing. You're ready to go. A second option for microphones are XLR microphones. And that is um, something you'll see in a more professional setting for concerts or giant recording halls. Usually they don't use USB microphones because they're tailored to individual setups like this. But if you've ever seen cables that look like this, this is the uh, female and male end of an XLR cable. It's hard to get the good thing, but you can see there's a three prong source here. So in the bottom of the microphone, you plug in the three prongs, uh, or maybe there's three pongs sticking out of the microphone. You plug that side in, you plug this side in, and you've got your XLR microphone. Now, the problem with this and doing a screen flow recording is that you can't plug this into a computer. I don't know of any computers, unless they're custom made, that have XLR inputs built in. So what you need to do is get something like this Tascam little audio interface. You can see here and right here, you have two audio inputs, and they're for these XLR cables. Um, you just take it and plug it right on in. It'll show up as one of your inputs. And then with the USB out of this Tascam mixer, you can bring it into your computer. So those are the basic ways. Of course, you can also use your, like your, your iPhone headphones. Just plug that in using that, uh, that 
I think it's like a three eighths inch input. Doesn't even matter the size. It's just the normal headphone input. You can plug that in and then use this microphone. I highly recommend not doing that because it's not good quality. You get a lot of movement. Like if it touches my beard here, it's going to make a lot of noise. And even if it just bounces off my shirt or something, I don't recommend using this kind of microphone to record. If you want to be even remotely professional sounding with your audio, um, a hundred dollar investment with a, a USB microphone like this is going to take you way past that hundred dollars that you invested in the mic. It's going to boost your content to a much higher level. So, those are the different ways of bringing audio in and you can choose each one of them from right here in the configure recording window. So before we get to actually recording, just check to see if there's any questions here. It doesn't look like there is. Be sure to put your questions in there if you have any. And now we're just going to do a quick uh, recording. Hang on a second. Let's, let's record my video real fast as well from my FaceTime HD camera. There you go. You can see me in the studio here. Hello. Um, and this way I'm just going to get some audio and some video and I'll even record my desktop. Let's do from the BMD HDMI and that'll just be this, this desktop background that you see. All right, let's start a quick recording. I'm going to just spit some gibberish out there and we'll use it as a uh, way to test how we can interact with our audio in ScreenFlow. So starting the recording, pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, when you are recording, another thing that you're going to want to maybe get, I do a lot of voiceover recording, is a pop filter. If you guys have ever seen those, um, they're just like a piece of fabric stretched across a cylinder. And you put that right in front of the microphone. And whenever you say your P's and your T's and your S's, none of that plosive action that comes out of your mouth will be picked up by the microphone because if you have a really sensitive microphone like one of these USB mics it will it will spike when you have those really hard consonants and so a pop filter is really helpful also don't do this don't hold the microphone in front of your face because even movement like this can screw with your sound so having a nice solid setup where you have enough room to move and you can, you know, directly face the microphone that you're using. It's going to be really helpful. So with that advice out of the way, let's go up here and stop that recording. And here we are back in ScreenFlow. And you can see I recorded three things here, but in ScreenFlow, I only get two things that pop up. I have my FaceTime HD camera and I've got my screen recording because what ScreenFlow does is it by default, if you record audio from an external source and video from an external source, it's going to mold those two tracks together. I personally don't like working like that. I like to see my video and my audio separately. So the first thing that I always do when dealing with audio in ScreenFlow, if I've recorded with a video as well, is I come up to this, I right click it and I say detach audio. It's just one of the options. What's going to happen is it's going to open up a third track and it's going to give me audio and video in two separate tracks, which makes everything just a lot easier for dealing with. So let's detach that audio. And now you can see I have my FaceTime camera here. I've got my FaceTime HD camera audio. They mix the two together, even though they're not coming from the same thing. I don't believe. Did I, did I record the wrong thing? Hang on a second. Let me just... No, I recorded the right audio. And then I have my desktop background, which in this case is really nothing. But let's let's just listen to this real fast. Let's get a sense for how it sounds. Pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, when you are recording, another thing that you're going to want to maybe get... You I can hear some of that, that microphone noise. Filter. If you guys have ever seen those... Um, they're just like a piece of fabric stretched across the cylinder and you put that right in front of the microphone. And you can tell as I get closer to the microphone, the audio is a little bit better. Plosive action over here. Also, don't do this. Don't hold the microphone in front of your face because even movement like this. Yeah. And right there, you can see with that movement of the microphone, my voice volume is going in and out a little bit. It is better. You could hear that when it was right in front of my face, it sounded really good. And I can see that in the audio um, in the, uh, in reflected in the audio waveforms here. That's that little green thing here in the screen flow, uh, tracks. See these guys, these little green parts, that's an audio waveform. And that's a visual representation of the sound that you're making. And if you look here, as I play it through the audio waveform is really small action 
that comes out of your mouth will be picked up by the microphone. And the audio there is not as good as right here when I picked it up and put it right in front of my face. And you can see that the audio waveform is a little bit bigger. Also, don't do this. Don't hold the microphone. That sounds really good right there. When I say don't do this, that's where it sounds really good. Also, don't do this. Don't hold. Now, just to clear up some confusion, just because you have a larger audio waveform in one of the tracks in ScreenFlow does not mean that your audio is better. It just means it's a little bit louder. In this case, it was louder and better, but but don't get confused and correlate a larger audio waveform with better audio. It's it's it doesn't work quite like that. It just means that because my mouth was closer to that microphone, it was picking up more of the sound. And in this case, with this specific microphone, it's better when you're a little bit closer. So now we're working with this. And one of the things that I do on a regular basis, hang on. Something that I do often is uh, record voiceovers. And then I have to edit those voiceovers and then put them on top of, whoa, and then put them on top of the content that I'm creating. So one of the things that I do is I'm going to actually move this down. I'm going to move this up. What I do is I zoom in as far as I can go and get the scrubber. And I really, really like taking out the dead space in between phrases that I've said. So if we look here, if I zoom way in here, like using these audio waveforms, I know that my, that's where the talking starts is right there. So I can come to this little point, press T for trim and then delete. And now pull my microphone up to my face here. That, that was kind of a strange thing because I started the recording in the middle of a, in the middle of a sentence, but I got rid of Pull my microphone. That little tiny intake of breath. L listen to that again. Pull my. It just sounded like that. It didn't sound good. What I can do is I can trim off that and start exactly where the audio starts. The the actual words. Pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, when. And and this is maybe a little extreme. You don't necessarily have to take out all of the intakes of breath, but I'm going to show you again a place where it would work. Listen to the separation between these two phrases. Up to my face here. Generally. Breathe in pretty heavily there. I can come in and by zooming in even closer, I can still see these audio waveforms. And as I scrub through, I'm pretty sure you guys can hear this. I can hear my voice chopped up into 60 frames per second. And there's that voice, there's that intake of breath right there that I don't want. So it ends right there. So I'll clip it there. And it starts right about there, so I'll clip it there as well. Now I can delete that intake of breath and watch this. Pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally when you are... And now there's no intake of breath. So one of the nice things this enables you to do is not only get rid of that awkward sound, but now... Phone up to my face here. Generally when you... It sounds like maybe I wanted a little bit more separation between those two phrases. So now I can move this over a little bit. And this over as well, and now we have microphone up to my face here. Even though generally when you even though when I was recording that those two phrases were right next to each other, I've now put a second and a half between them. So it allows you to when you go into the, with like a fine tooth comb and you start really trimming out each one of these phrases, you can start to set the cadence of the speaking when you're doing these voiceovers. You can you can you know, when you're recording, you can just kind of run through and if you don't get the timing on it just right, or maybe if you make a mistake and you have to do it, you can make the pauses between phrases sound natural just by editing them in and out. So let's do a couple more here because I want to show you what you can do with nesting clips when you're done. Generally, when you are recording, another thing that you're going to want to maybe get, I do a lot of voice. Ooh, did you hear that? I, you're gonna want to I knocked my microphone right there. Recording, another thing that you're going to want to hear that? That's, I mean... I would probably just record, re-record that area because you cannot take out that sound. That's something that, that I've encountered with people in the past. They say, hey, I've got this random sound in the background of my, my, my recording. How do I take it out? Well, listen, listen to this and listen to my voice simultaneously. You are recording another thing that you're going to want to make. I can't take out that microphone hit without taking out what I was saying in the background. So in that case, it's just like a... A finished clip you can't 
It's with ScreenFlow, you cannot pull out extraneous noises like that. Maybe with some very, very technical ed audio editing programs, you might be able to, but first of all, you're gonna have to buy those audio editing programs and then you're gonna have to learn how to use them and then learn how to do that. And I don't, I don't have any idea how to do that kind of stuff. That is professional level audio editing and, and it's not, not something that you'll find unless you start spending a lot of money on software. You're gonna wanna maybe get, I do a lot of voiceover recording. So there's another voice. Let's take out that that breath. There we go. Is a pop filter. If you guys have ever seen those, um, they're just like a piece of fabric stretched across the cylinder. Yeah. And you put that right in front of the microphone, and whenever you there's another breath, we can get rid of. Microphone. Right there. And, and, and we, we can even get rid of that and. Maybe I don't want that and there. So now I've got. A couple different pieces of audio. Pull my microphone up to my face. Here. Generally, when you are recording, is a pop filter. If you just like stretched across this, and then maybe we don't want the rest of this. We can just delete it. But now I have all these chunks. One thing that I like to do here is I can come over, move these into a. Excuse me, I would probably get rid of that. Move these into a, a logical cadence of of sound. Microphone a up nice to my face speaking here. pattern. Generally, when you are recording. And then I'm going to highlight all of them and nest them. And now this is one cohesive thought as opposed to maybe some mess ups and some things and things that didn't quite work out and intakes of breath that we took out. Now I've got recording and pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally when you are recording. Now I've got one track that has all of those phrases together. You can group them by sentence, by thought, by uh, PowerPoint slide if you're putting this voice over over a PowerPoint. <coughs> Excuse me. Or if you're recording a video and you have a couple different scenes in your video, this is scene one audio, scene two audio, and then you can start to really rejigger them and, and do what you want. So I'm gonna get rid of all of these edits that I made because they weren't actually real edits. And there we go, that should be good. And now I have, again, my... Our recording, another thing that you're going to want to maybe get. I... Uh, now we've got our original stuff. So one thing that you might run into, if you're pulling video and audio from two separate sources, it might not always come into ScreenFlow perfectly in sync. And that's because different interfaces, different ways of uh, plugging in your external devices, the speed that it takes to transfer the information is sometimes different depending on what piece of equipment you're using. So I'm not sure if you guys can see it or if I even see it, but if we take my camera Pull here my and we blow this up and we watch my mouth compared to the sound that I'm making, let's see if it matches. Your phone up to my face here. Generally, when you are recording, another thing that you're going to want to maybe get, I do a lot of voice. It looks pretty good, but I feel like it's a little bit off. And one of the best ways to deal with this is by stepping through frame by frame and lining it up. That's the best way to do it in ScreenFlow. And in order to do that, you're going to use the bracket keys. Uh, that should be right above return and like your apostrophe or your quotation mark, the bracket keys. It's it's hard to really show, but if I zoom in way over here, and we pull this all the way to the front, see how everything is lined up there on the left-hand side? Well, I have the audio now uh, highlighted. Watch at the zero mark when I when I press this bracket key. As I start doing it, you can see it slowly, slowly nudging to the right. Every time I press a bracket key, it gives me one indentation in. And theoretically, because if you can see over here next to my left shoulder, it's highlighted there 60 frames per second. I'm working in a timeline that is 60 frames per second. So that's going to give me 60 increments of starting time between zero seconds and one second. So I can finally tune when my audio starts and stops in comparison with the video. So if I play it now, pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, when you are recording another thing, that, you that actually looks a lot better, doesn't it? If we start over again, pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, when you are recording, that looks way off. So if I do this and I step it forward, maybe, you know, a third of a second, another thing that you're going to want to maybe get, I do a lot of voiceover. That looks a lot better. 
So it gives you a lot of control with lining up audio by using those bracket keys. It's just a nice little hotkey to step audio tracks back and forth. And it's not just audio tracks. Uh, you can do that with any piece of media in ScreenFlow. I just found it very useful when lining up audio with someone's talking face and the voice that they made. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about with, with regards to the editing itself is audio filters. Oh, I probably shouldn't do that. So let's make this a little bit smaller. Make sure we've got our audio selected and let's come over to the audio tab. And that's where we can, you know, do all things. We can change the audio. We can mute it. We can do ducking. We can smooth the uh, volume levels. These kind of things I don't generally use myself. Uh, smoothing of the audio levels. I spend a lot of time um, in the studio. Uh, not in the studio, not even in the studio, but the whisper suite over here. We got this nice little soundproof room. Oh, wow. Scott Rogers says something that I also do that I didn't tell you about. But he, he said he lines up his audio with a clap. So before you start recording, go... Give it four claps. And what that does is it gives you a very strict visual indicator as well as a very sharp audio indicator to line up. So you have those four big claps and the visual of your hands clapping. And you can line those up. And it's a lot easier to line up something sharp and quick like that than it is to, you know, someone who maybe mumbles and talks like this. It's hard to really see what their mouth is doing and line everything up perfectly. So using those claps that's why when you watch like behind the scenes of a movie someone will come up and they got that little zebra striped clapper thing and they're like take 27 scene 36 boom and they make that big smacking sound that's syncing up the audio for all of the cameras and all the microphone sources that's why they do it in movies you can transfer that over to the recording of your own projects thanks scott i think that's a really good point um back to editing audio here I don't smooth the volume levels because I generally am in a pretty good place. But if you want to, you can, you can, you can uh, experiment with this. As you can see, it totally changed what my audio looks like. So let's, let's listen to it now. Pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, when you are recording, another thing that you're going to want to maybe get, I do a lot of voiceover. And let's go over here where I know it sounded better. Also, don't do this. Don't hold the microphone. So what it's done is it, if I take the smoothing of volume levels off, you can see that this area right here where I pulled the microphone up to my face is a little bit louder, a little bit clearer. So what smoothing the volume levels does is it kind of takes those low lows and the high highs and just kind of compresses them back together to make them a little bit more normalized. Normalizes and smooths out the volume in the cl clip, producing a clip with a more uniform volume. So if you're having troubles or maybe you move around a lot and you get closer and further away from your mic, whatever it is, you can, you can use that uh, smoothing of volume levels to make things a little bit more uniform so you don't have super quiet parts and super loud parts. Ducking is... Um, Ducking will cause the volume of other active audio clips in the timeline to reduce when sound is detected in the selected clip. So what you do is imagine you have five different audio tracks going and you want one to be super prominent when it is playing. You can add ducking to your track and it will quiet all the other audio tracks while this one is playing. Um, if you look at something like a nature documentary and you've you've got this nice long pan shot of springtime in the in the mountain stream with a bear who's looking for berries or something and then david attenborough comes in and starts you know saying the brown bear is a beautiful animal whatever it is watch those again and you might hear that the background noise of the the ambient sound of the birds chirping and the bugs flying around and the splashing of the water in the creek that will get a little bit more quiet when the narrator comes in to say something. That's because they're ducking the background audio and making sure that that narrator's voice is out loud. That's what ducking does, and ScreenFlow will do that for you automatically. So you choose the audio track that you want, add ducking to it, and whenever it's active, everything else will be a little bit more quiet. So Wendell says, I record vocal music and will usually use the smoothing volume levels. And that makes a lot of sense because... When you're, when you're talking into a microphone, when you're doing a voiceover, when you're doing that kind of stuff, you don't generally have a huge range of volumes. You don't have this dynamic thing going on. You're not, you know, 
trying to evoke tons of emotion when you're doing like an hour long presentation about the technicalities of one of your products. But when you're recording music, that's what music is all about. And so sometimes you get really quiet, sometimes you get really loud and smoothing out the volume levels will keep the, the like the, I don't know how to say it other than that it'll keep the emotion of the quiet and loud parts, but it won't make it so extreme that you can't hear one side and the other. Maybe Wendell, uh, that's, that's the same kind of thing that you're doing. You also have the ability to remove background noise. Um, and I think this is really important for a lot of people who don't have the greatest place to record audio. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play back the first 10 seconds of this. Then I'm going to add the remove background noise filter and we'll see if we can hear the difference pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, when you are recording, another thing that you're going to want to maybe get, I do a lot of voiceover recording, is a pop filter, if you guys have ever seen those. So let's see if we can add background noise. And there is a sliding scale here. Oh, <laughs> excuse me. We're going to remove background noise. We're not going to add it. There's a sliding scale here. Let's try 80% and just see how it sounds. See if we can get anything different. Pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, when you are recording, another thing that you're going to want to maybe get, I do a lot of voiceover. So one of, one of the issues with trying to demo this here is that when I recorded that, I didn't have a lot of background noise because I'm in a pretty well insulated, well, well insulated in a, in a noise perspective room here. So we've got, you know, like lots of measures built into this room to keep that, that external noise down. And what happens is like, if I make this really extreme, you can hear that it's almost like overcompensating and it's distorting my, vo my, my voice. Listen here again, pull my microphone up to my face Ooh, right there. You can Generally hear it. it sounds like it's like in a tube. Another thing that you're going to want to maybe get, I do a lot of voiceover. So you have to be really careful when using this because it is very effective, but you can overdo it. I, I can't imagine a scenario where 100% is a good idea. When I used to do a lot of video game streaming, I would use about a 20% background noise removal because that just takes like the edge off of anything. If you're recording outside, there's going to be background noise. You can't get rid of the, the world sound, but you can mellow it out a little bit. So I would use this around 20%, 30%. Really, you have to test it out yourself and see what you like. But remember, when you're adding this filter, it can get extreme if you use too much of a percentage. So you got to tone it back a little bit and make sure that it is what you're looking for. Um, and then we have effects and audio filters. And these are these are probably better for someone like Wendell who's, who's recording uh, music because you, sometimes you want some sort of like reverb. But is there an audio filter to remove white noise in narrations? Now, there's a couple things to do there, Scott. One of the things I would do is, like I said earlier, when you're narrating, go through and edit out every single pause, every single one of them. And that way, you don't have a lot of the white noise in between speaking. So you only hear the voices. Then, once you've done that, you can tone up the background noise to about 20%. That's probably the best way to do it. But in reality, Scott, the best thing to do is to minimize it before you even start recording. Work on creating a space that has no white noise. And and I totally understand it's not always in everyone's budget to have something like this. We work for Telestream. Before I even started working here, they got this whisper room. And it was thousands of dollars, like $4,000 maybe. They're pretty expensive, but they are very good. And if you can't spend that kind of money, which I know in my life, I would never be able to do that putting blankets up on the walls, sitting on your bed with a, with like a little box in front of you that you put your microphone on and pulling your comforter over your head is going to cut out so much noise. It's unbelievable. It does, you know, introduce other aspects like the fact that you're sitting on a bed and everything's moving around, but doing something like that can cut down drastically on that white noise that you're talking about. So yes, there are ways to take it out in post, but really the best way to do is make sure that at the beginning, you don't have an environment where there's a lot of white noise. If you have a lot of computers on and a lot of fans going, turn them off. See if you can shut down as much as you possibly can. Um, so let's look at presence here. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but they're a lot of fun. Let's go to a large chamber and let's give it 100%. Now you can see what something like this does. Pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, when you are recording, another thing you're going to want to maybe get, I do a lot of voice. That sounds terrible. <laughs> Let, let's, let's keep that large chamber effect, but let's drop it down to 20% and see if that makes it palatable. 
pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, when you are recording, another thing that you're going to want... It makes a little bit more sense. If you're doing a narration, you don't want to put something like this on it. That sounds like a bad idea. Maybe we switch to small room because it sounds like I'm starting in a, sitting in a small room. Let's try 100% to get an idea of it. Pull my microphone up to my face here. That's Generally, way too distorted. But if we drop it down to 15%, maybe it'll sound nice. Pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, when you are recording, another thing... That I actually kind of like that because if I take it off, it'll sound a little bit different. So let's... Let's listen to it off, and I'm not going to say anything, and then we're going to listen to it on. That way you can get a good understanding of the two. Pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, when you are recording, another thing... That Pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, when you are recording... It sounds like I'm in a room with somebody. It sounds a little bit more natural. I actually kind of like that. I might start using that with some of my stuff. I, I don't often because it does sound pretty good when you're in that whisper room, but... It seems like it could be pretty cool. So you can go through these effects and, tr and try different things out. Some things might work better for the kind of audio that you're going for. Now, the last thing in the audio system here is audio filters. And I got to say, I've, I've, worked at, I've worked at Telestream for a little over four years. And I've spent a lot of time researching audio. And I still don't go out of my way to use these things. I don't understand how they work. I don't believe that my life is going to be that much better if I totally understood how everything worked. There are certain things, like if we use Apple's audio unit dynamics processor. We can open this up. If you guys understand what this kind of stuff is, go ahead and use it. There's certain things that I understand, like the master gain. If I boost that way up, woo, look at that audio track. I just boosted up the volume massively. If I drop it way down, now you can't hear anything. So there's certain things that I understand, but... I mean, I can also just adjust the volume, you know? So I don't use these very often. I don't understand them very well, and I, and I truthfully don't believe that me, you know, going through an entire audio course is going to really improve the way that I approach my audio because having a nice recording environment, recording the audio and doing the edits that I've showed you in the past 10 minutes is going to get you so far that going in and fine-tuning stuff like this isn't necessarily what you need to be doing if you're recording music like wendell is maybe you're going to want to know some more stuff like this but for normal talking voices for recording audio for a majority of the videos that i can imagine people doing you don't need to get deep into this stuff maybe one day we'll we'll get someone who's an expert and they can teach me or maybe even come on the show but right now i would stay away from the audio filters with effects with the filters that we have and the ability to go in and do some fine-tuned editing Mixed with the fact that if you spend a little bit of time on the front end, making sure you have a good environment to record sound, you're going to be just fine. Make sure you put some questions in here um, because I'm going to go over the exporting of audio really quick and then we're going to be done for the day. So if you have any extra questions, let me know. Wendell says, I use the equalizer when I have too harsh of highs when playing a harmonica. So there you go. Like I said, if you're doing something with music and you have all these different sounds coming in, these kind of audio filters are going to be helpful. Looks like Wendell knows what he's talking about. It helps to take out those harsh, high, high sounds. But uh, in general, the human voice when talking is not going to mean to be treated in that way. All right, let's go back into ScreenFlow. Let's go up to Export. And let's look at this. So uh, you have two options here. Remember, you have Automatic and Manual. And if you want to focus on your audio specifically, you're going to have to get away from automatic and you're going to have to set up your own manual export settings. So let's come over to manual. Choose web high. I already have one web high custom, customized, but I generally like to start with web high and then customize. And in here, you can come in and you can adjust. And if you only want to export the audio, you don't want to export the video, turn off the video. It's that simple. And now you're only working with your audio. If you have a desire to make it mono, you can. I've never done that ever. But if you want to, if you have a reason to, go ahead and do it. But I always keep it in stereo. The data rate, I, I never, ever adjust these things. And I wouldn't recommend doing it unless you know a reason why you want to change the sample rate or the data rate. But in general, 44.1 and 256, if you see those two numbers there, you're going to be fine. Everything's going to be okay. You have 44, 1, and 48, or you know 80 all the way up to 320. But if you keep them like this and say, okay, 
Let's do audio test and export. Boom. Just like that. One minute of audio exported in a half a second, if even that. Uh, let's see where I put that. I think I put it on my desktop. Hang on a second. Yep, there it is. And let's pull it up here and let's play it back. Ugh, it's not letting me pull it up to this desktop, but I'll just play it from here. Here we go. It's opening up. It is an MP4. It has no video, but it is an MP4. Pull my microphone up to my face here. Generally, the microphone in front of your face. One of these USB mics. So there you go. I've just exported just the, the audio in MP4 form. ScreenFlow does not allow you to export as an MP3. But I know like in iTunes, you can convert it to an MP3. You can probably find some um, converters online. We have a product we make called Switch. If you want to check that out, that can convert MP4s to MP3s as well, I believe. Um, you can find ways of converting them into MP3. And the reason why you'd want to do that is maybe if you're making just an audio track, no volume, and you want to put it on your iPhone and listen to it when you're going to work, you can do that. I know a lot of people might use ScreenFlow for podcasting. That's the way to do it, man. Export it out. Without the uh, the video file, you can have a one hour long podcast that exports in like two minutes. You know, it's not a not a big deal at all. Will, it will. So that's what I have for today. All about audio. We talked about different types of microphones, how to bring those microphones in. If maybe you want to pull it in using one of these handy dandy little buggers. Um, we talked about how to edit them, how to add effects, good tactics for uh, maximizing your, your efficiency when you take out the ums and the ahs and the screw-ups and the intakes of breath, re-nesting them into individual audio clips that you can then adjust. Um, one thing I didn't say about that is if you're going to do heavy editing, you have to realize that if you also want the video, it's not going to look very good. So if you want the video and your voice, you're going to have to do it in one take. Otherwise, I mean, you can. If you watch a lot of YouTube videos these days, people are, you know, the people that are like vloggers that talk about what they want to talk about for hours on end. You'll see that they'll be talking, and in the middle of the sentence, it'll cut. And then they're still talking about the same thing. It's because they couldn't get that sentence out in one take, and they just, they're just they splicing everything together. There are ways to do it. I recommend practicing a little bit and just taking it in one take. But it is okay to do a lot of cuts if you need to. Um, and then we talked about exporting and then converting to MP3s if you want to do that. So before we leave, just a reminder, you can follow us on all social media, Facebook, facebook.com slash ScreenFlow, on Twitter, at ScreenFlow, and on YouTube, at ScreenFlowTube is the name of our channel. Um, and then, of course, if you want to be notified when we're going live, you can see right here, telestream.net slash ScreenFlow Live. We will be going live every other Wednesday unless something happens. Um, and uh, Deborah Lee wanted me to tell you that we have a brand new system, a new computer for broadcasting this. And she was like, I don't know, maybe I'm going to make a mistake, but she didn't. She nailed it. You guys wouldn't have even known, but I just wanted to give props to Deborah Lee behind the curtain. She's doing a good job. And then we also have a advanced users webinar coming up on April 26th at 11 a.m. If you go to the ScreenFlow page, you can find the uh, events link there. You can sign up for it, come and we'll be talking about all sorts of advanced techniques, how to how to use motion and graphics in your transitions and how to make templates in ScreenFlow and reuse them and uh, good ways to save time. L lots of really good stuff going on in the advanced users um, ScreenFlow webinar. So with that, thanks everyone for coming and I will see you guys all in a couple weeks. Have a good weekend.